Here we go. Little red dot is pulsating. Welcome back, everyone. And we begin, as always, with uh, a little prayer. O Lord, send forth your spirit, and we shall be recreated. You shall renew the face of the earth. Amen. All right, this is, uh, again, the course in bioethics, the, the master's program, cell molecular biology, the course in bioethics. And this is our second lecture. Mm -hmm. Were you all able to see the video if you needed it and so forth? Everything is working okay so far? All right, I figured no news, good news. No one <laughs> complained or sent an email, so. That's what, oh, speaking of emails, yes. Mm, so I'm antiquated and that's how, don't post your thing on Canvas uh, summary, but send it to me by email like you did, all right, in Word. So I ask you to please do it in Word because as you can see, I rearranged the furniture a little bit. I don't change the context, the, the, your content itself, but I rearrange it so that I can make comments on it, all right? So when you do your summaries going forward, don't do it in PDF, but in Word. And that way I can, uh, I usually try to print it in one page, front and back, so that not to use extra paper. Uh, for my notation, um, I'll give a little slide that has some of the hieroglyphics that I use <laughs> for a notation, but one that is uh, IOW, in other words, is one abbreviation. B slash C is because uh, three dots that actually look like three little dashes. That's uh, therefore, I use that a lot, therefore, all right? So you'll see if there's some notation on my comments that you don't understand, just ask me, I'll be happy to address it. Typically what I do is I circle the keywords and then I make some comments. Mm -hmm. And some comments may be just affirming what you're saying or correcting what I find that may be wrong, either on the biological side or on the philosophical slash theological side, or the ethical side. All right. So again, if you don't understand my hieroglyphics, sometimes I abbreviate uh, and it's a chicken scratch because I'm left-handed and uh, the more I type, the less calligraphy that I have. <laughs> and it's hard to interpret. Just ask me, all right? All right. Questions, comments? No? Good. All right, then I post uh, the grade there on Canvas, just lecture one, two, three, four, so you have access to that, and I give you this out. Eliza, my apologies, I just didn't have time uh, to send you your um, uh, summary, but it's already graded, so at the end of the lecture, I'll take a photograph with my phone and uh, send it to you, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so, what I want to do is uh, just, um, first of all, to look at uh, today's lecture, we're going to talk about, uh, finish up this whole issue of the ontological status or the status of the human embryo. Ontological is a philosophical word. Ontos means being, the being. Who or what is the human embryo, all right? It answers that question. What is the ontological status? Who or what is the human embryo? in his or her totality, right? human being, human person, human life. Good. So we need to look at the issue of ensoulment and then two challenges to saying that uh, human life begins at fertilization, the individual life, because the soul is an individual soul and it's indivisible, it's simple and therefore cannot be divided. And so we need to look at the challenge of monozygotic twinning and even more challenging, twin reabsorption, which happens in the womb, all right? When one embryo or fetus absorbs his or her sibling <laughs> in the womb. <laughs> so we need to address those philosophically so that the biology matches the philosophy and the theology and we can uh, make a, an overall ethical conclusion. Before doing that, uh, just a little summary of what we recovered uh, last time, which was basically embryonic development. Well, I looked at gametogenesis, a sperm and egg, which fuse in the process called fertilization, right? A unique process in, um, in uh, nature, whereby two cells fuse, two cells coming from two different individuals of the same species, 
fuse and actually form a viable product, <laughs> which is called the zygote. And zygote is a universal. We'll look a little bit more at this word, um, um, but it, it comes from the Greek meaning uh, zygon or uh, yoke or linked together. And then the various stages of embryonic development from the zygote forward, basically it's mitosis, it's cell division, which is a geometric progression. In other words, from one cell, one mother cell, we get two daughter cells, right? That's just straight up mitosis. Each one of those two daughter cells, when they become large enough that there's too much volume for the surface, for the membrane to hold that volume, then they split again. And it's a volume to surface ratio issue, right? Uh, like a balloon, if you think of a balloon that is being uh, filled up with water, at some point that balloon becomes taunt. And if we continue to put water in there, that balloon will burst because it's got too much volume for its um, uh, surface. Mm -hmm. Because the volume triples, the, vo the volume is cubed, but the surface is only doubled. Mm -hmm. duplicated. So at some point, uh, nature figured out that by splitting the cell in half, then that ratio of volume to surface is reduced. So that uh, the volume is halved and the surface is halved. And what who benefits from that ratio is the surface. There is less volume proportionally to surface. All right. And that's why the daughter cells are smaller than the mother cell. They're about half the size. And then those each one of those daughter cells grows again as it metabolizes because it's absorbing also water in the process uh, until they become taunt and then they have to split and so forth. And we get what is known as a geometric progression. One, two, four, what follows? Four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 132, right? Okay, it's a geometric progression as opposed to a linear progression, which is one, two, three, four, five, that's linear, okay? But geometric is parabolic. All right, so you can see that very quickly, the embryo accumulates a lot of cells. <laughs> hmm? And so within days, about five to seven days, we have a cluster of cells called the blastocyst. And uh, at that point, we have two different um, cell layers and so forth. The inner cell layer will become the embryo proper, the outer cell layer will become the placenta and so forth. Then we go through the various stages of embryonic development. Within nine months, there is birth. So all this to point out this continuous process that goes on and it's consistent with the embryology of every other mammal and every other species that goes through these uh, stages, even the marsupial mammals that change location, but the process continues, you know, that the in marsupials, uh, the little embryo comes out premature and then has to find its way up to the pouch. Marsup what are marsupials? The kangaroo, the wallaby, right? All those, uh, they, yeah, they, they live in their Australian uh, mammals, primitive, never develop a placenta, but they are mammals. And so that little embryo goes into the pouch and what's inside the pouch? <laughs> There's one tit. <laughs> There's one tit there, okay? And what the embryo does is it swallows the tit <laughs> and it becomes like a placenta. <laughs> it's a tit that has a long, long nipple and they just suck it in and swallow it down to the stomach. And for weeks or months, that's what they nourish on, all right? So it's the analogous, the functional analogous of a placenta. <laughs> and so they're large enough to come out and then they go back in and out <laughs> to the pouch, even when they're kids where they're relatively large, they want to get in there. At some point, they're too large to go into the pouch. The mom kicks them out. Well, yeah, so uh, mammals, uh, placental mammals, pick up on suckling uh, after birth, right? right. But uh, placental mammals develop a further stage of, um, of protection by keeping the embryo inside in gestation for a longer time, precisely by the development of a placenta. And that's why we say that marsupials are more primitive. They're all mammals, but they're more primitive than the placental mammals, okay? In fact, there's one that is even more primitive, the echidna, which is also a mammal, but it actually lays an egg. <laughs>
And the platypus, yes, exactly. Echidna and platypus are the two, yeah. All right, at any rate, uh, we have this um, uh, process, which is a continuous process, biologically speaking. So at no point does this change species, right? Or from non-species to species. I think that's where I left it, that there is no unspecific life in nature. When we look around, all living organisms, they belong to some particular species. There's no blob that is unspecified. That blob will belong to a species. The only uh, quasi blob that I can think of is, for example, a slime mold, <laughs> right? That looks like a blob, but it's actually a slime mold. It's a fungus. <laughs> so it belongs to a particular species, phylum, etc. Okay, so you see how philosophy um, and biology um, corroborate with each other and affirm each other in making a consistent argument. The argument has to be of logical consistency, okay? That's a reasonable, rational argument without having to invoke, invoke God, nature, I mean, God or faith or religion, just the argument of nature itself. So some conclusions then that we can come up with this whole fertilization embryonic development is that life begins at fertilization, including the human, for animals and plants that reproduce um, sexually. Right? There's a continuous development throughout that embryonic stage and uh, in humans, it's a nine month development on average. And then after birth, development continues also. If we leave a little brand new baby, a newborn on the sidewalk, uh, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna last for too long, right? Without any care and, and protection and nourishment and suckling. <laughs> so continued development even after birth um, until adulthood for about two dozen years more. Okay, so we got all that. Now, the key question to ask here is, we can say, okay, so it's individual human life, but is it, I'm gonna put it in quotations, it is, is it a human being and is it a human person, all right? And here we have to make a distinction between human person anthropologically and human person legally, because we know for a fact that an unborn human being all right, or let's say an unborn a human embryo or human fetus inside his or her mother's womb is not a legal person in the United States. How do we know that? It's not a legal person, it doesn't have the protection of the law, it doesn't, have, it doesn't appear in the constitution. And that because they can be killed. Abortion up to the ninth month, legal, right? And so we know for a fact that in the United States and many other countries of the world, where abortion is legal, then the human unborn, the human embryo, the human fetus is not considered a legal person. Because if it were, it would have the protection of the law. Okay, but it doesn't. And that's the whole argument. And what I'm trying to say here is that the word person is not univocal. I don't know if you've heard of this word before, but words are either univocal or not, meaning that they have a single meaning or not, right? So it's, um, not you, me, vocal. It has several meanings depending. If we talk about law, then, for example, a corporation, the five of us or the six of us, I realize that the six of us could decide to form a corporation, right? We're going to incorporate and we make a corporation and we register it with the state of Florida. And we are the five of us, the, the, sorry, the, six, the six of us, Inc. That Inc. We incorporate it. We become a legal person, one legal person, but we're six individuals. So that's the law, all right? So you see that the word person legally is different from anthropologically. I think we all agree that we are six persons in this, in this course, we're six persons, anthropologically, right? Okay, so the whole challenge here is to, uh, to recognize the personhood of the unborn. <laughs> even if the state doesn't recognize it, or even society at large. To do that, we have to do a little more development of uh, the issue of a person and realize uh, what person means, right? Which uh, person comes from prosopon, and that's a little, a little added, added value of this course. The added value is that along the way, you're gonna pick up a little Latin and Greek. <laughs> 
because uh, many of our terms, especially the significant symbolic terms in science and in philosophy and in theology come from Romance languages or uh, Romance languages derived from Latin and Latin derives from Greek. So we go to the source. It's what is called the etymology of the word. The etymology is the origin and meaning of the word. And sometimes uh, it's good to look at the etymology because then we find out uh, what the word uh, is supposed to mean, right? And person comes from prosopon, <laughs> prosopon in Greek, which means the mask. Uh, reference specifically to the Greek theater. If you recall Greek theater going back uh, about 300 years before the time of Christ. It is amazing. These guys, they really had it together, okay? Uh, they had so many sciences and, and uh, arts and humanities developed. Look at this amphitheater. At first blush, what does it remind you of? A modern structure that is used in sound. <laughs> a woofer, a uh, novocina, what do you call that? Uh, speaker, right? A speaker that is truncated in the back, but is very much like one of those large speakers of... Um, of um, speaker system. <laughs> hmm? And it is amazing, these people speaking here with somewhat of a large voice, the sound would actually transmit and will actually amplify through the amphitheater, all right, especially in hard surface like a stone. It amplifies, instead of getting a, a, a smaller, the sound whisper to the, to the back pews here, it actually magnifies and you can hear the people talking down here. It is just incredible because sound actually magnifies <laughs> with distance, the sound wave. Mm -hmm. And it makes it reverberate just like a speaker does. So anyway, classical Greek theater is very interesting because their mythology was very rich. Their mythology was polytheistic. They believe in many gods. I think I spoke a little bit about that uh, earlier gods and goddesses, and they mix with the humans and so forth. Uh, at any rate, theater started precisely to represent their mythology. It was, uh, if you will, like their catechism, <laughs> all right? Uh, but it was so rich, they would do these the uh, theatrical representations, and the theater was very mm, simple in original in the choreography, very, very simple. The original plays were tragedies, were tragedies because we were, humans were at the fate of the gods and the gods and goddesses would play with us. We were the play things of the, of the gods and goddesses and the earth was their playground. And so it was tragedy because it was a fatalistic, we couldn't get away from the fate of the gods and goddesses playing with us, with humans, right? At any rate, a tragedy was the first one, and there would be a, the actor, who was typically a male with a large voice, <laughs> would either stand or sit here and would have a table in front of him with different masks. And each mask would represent a different god or goddess. And that's where the prosopon comes in, all right? Because the mask simultaneously reveals and conceals. The mask would reveal the god or goddess. And you notice that the mask typically, the mouth is open and the eyes also so that he could see around, right? But if he was going to talk about like Jupiter, he would pick up the mask of Jupiter and project out his voice. And that was Jupiter speaking. The people in the audience could care less of who the, um, the actor was. What they were concerned is to hear what Jupiter had to say. Uh, and then they, he would put down that mask and pick up Saturn or Venus, the different gods or goddesses, and would speak out, right? And so typically their mouths are open so that the voice could come out. Mm -hmm. And so the mask simultaneously reveals and conceals. It reveals the, uh, the protagonist, right? And conceals the actor. And that is propos upon and it is, uh, that's where the origin of the word person and what part of our body truly represents each one of our persons. It is obvious that the face does, the countenance, the face, right? I mean, from the neck down, men and women are more or less the same. They have more or less the same parts in different proportions, but the face is unique to each one of us. 
it's personal. The face is personal. And that's why the mask, this other mask thing, <laughs> is so bothersome because we can't fully see the whole person, right? <laughs> the, many of the uh, feelings, sentiments, and emotions, it's amazing how many muscles we have in our countenance, in our face, to be able to express different sentiments, feelings, thoughts, uh, joy, anger, uh, terror, uh, you know, so many things that we can express. At the same time, it also remains concealed because at the end of the day, no one knows what I'm really thinking except myself. <laughs> and we can portray one thing with the face, but really be thinking something very different. Or we can be honest with our countenance, right? <laughs> so at any rate, this, uh, I made the discovery when I was doing my first doctorate in Rome uh, in the 90s, uh, doing research in the library, that person comes from prosopon. And so from this perspective, uh, it is my opinion that the human embryo uh, throughout nine months of development is actually mm, um, can attribute uh, personhood because they simultaneously reveal and conceal. Because they are in stage of development, they are revealing that particular stage of development. In other words, this embryo is looking exactly how a human embryo should look at this stage. Right? Obviously, it doesn't look like you and I. The countenance is very diffuse and not well formed yet. Just before birth, this fetus has a much more defined countenance face, right? And so the fetus is looking just like he or she is supposed to look before birth, right? But the zygote looks just like it is supposed to look at the zygote stage. And so if we look at this issue of personhood philosophically, I think that we can make an argument for granting or recognizing personhood even on the unborn because each stage actually looks like it, it's supposed to look. And at the same time, so it's revealing its own stage of development consistent with embryonic de development like the Carnegie stages, right? And at the same time, what is concealing? It's concealing the human genome that is within, but it's always human genome from the fertilized egg all the way to birth, where there are literally trillions of cells forming this, this uh, fetus, well, all of the cells are human by way of the genome, all right? And so it's there, it's consistent. Anyway, it's a little uh, philosophical argument again, how we can match up uh, personhood, anthropologically speaking, with the unborn and be consistent so that we don't have to say that personhood begins at birth, because that's an arbitrary why. You know, why is it a birth? It's totally arbitrary. Mm -hmm. the, the birthing process is a, a passage, it's a rite of passage, if you will, but there's nothing substantial ontologically that changes from that fetus before or after birth. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's with regards to personhood, but one has to understand a little bit the philosophical arguments, and that's where they come from. Now, Ensoulment, we also need to address the theological question of ensoulment because uh, we have two possibilities, either immediate ensoulment or delayed ensoulment. But I mean by ensoulment, another way of looking at ensoulment is conscience, for example. If the soul sounds too religious to some people, well, we can use a substitute word, which is uh, conscious and consciousness, right? And so people may question whether we have a soul or not. They may say, well, that's your belief because you're a Catholic and a priest, so you should believe in the soul. <laughs> but I happen to be you know, not Catholic, uh, uh, and so I don't believe in the soul. I say, well, let's change soul for conscious and consciousness, at least a seat of moral decision-making. And say, well, uh, they may think, Okay, so you believe in, in a conscience, I don't believe in a conscience. Okay, would any normal, rational person go outside in the streets naked? You know, normal people don't do that. And so there's a conscience. There's a conscience that says it's a moral conscience, says that we normally don't do that, even if it's very hot. <laughs> so it's not, we don't wear the clothing just because of the cold, we wear the clothing because of pudor, because of, of um, uh, the ethical moral issue, right? 
that we will be embarrassed. Any normal person, again, I'm appealing to the norm. I understand there are exceptions, <laughs> okay? And there were some exceptions in the 60s and the 70s. I was growing up in the 60s and the 70s with the hippie movement and all that, and Woodstock and people going around naked and, and the streakers. I don't know if you remember streakers. <laughs> that was the thing that became popular in the 70s uh, that uh, uh, some uh, students would strip except for the tennis shoes and would run around with streak through campus. <laughs> Those were the streakers. <laughs> it was a crazy time, very crazy time. Uh, at any rate, uh, no normal people would do that, right? And that's why they actually ran, because <laughs> they knew that they were not doing something normal. At any rate, so uh, to make an argument for the soul or the conscience, which is um, granted by God. And here I do have to appeal to a higher power, because as much as our parents would try, uh, they can only give us the genetics. They cannot give us uh, a conscience because the conscience is unique, is uh, personal, is um, simple in the sense that it doesn't have parts like our body has parts and it's indivisible, all right? And so these are some characteristics of the soul or the conscience that is uh, personal and simple so that it doesn't have parts, not composite, and that it's indivisible, indivisible. Oops, so that third characteristic of indivisible, then, uh, Professor, how do you deal with uh, hmm, uh, twins and uh, monozygotic twins, right? Because we get from one individual, two individuals. Mm -hmm. And even the hardest case is going in reverse from two individuals to one. We'll get there. All right, so uh, let's move forward a little bit. First, uh, I'm quoting here St. John Paul II, who was, by the way, a philosopher before he became, um, well, he was a professor at the university uh, in philosophy. Mm. And he talks about body and soul one. In other words, there's a substantial unit between body and soul so that our soul is not something that's poured into the body uh, uh, like we would pour water into a glass and we can still have the water and the glass separate in their own existence. No. Body and soul are what we call a substantial unit. Mm? Uh, in philosophical terms and theological terms, uh, you may run across this hylomorphic. That word hylomorphic, meaning that there's a substantial unity between body and soul. We are body and soul one substantial unit, all right? Now, in soul meant, if we are upholding that uh, humanity begins at fertilization, then uh, God would grant the soul at fertilization also. And it would be what we call immediate ensoulment as opposed to delayed ensoulment. Immediate as opposed to delayed ensoulment at the time of fertilization. Okay? Now, Two challenges that come from biology because our biology, our philosophy and our theology has to be consistent with our biology, you follow? That's the whole argument of a logical consistency that we can navigate from one field to another as in bioethics and not be uh, making up stuff, fantasy <laughs> that doesn't exist either in nature or in the supernatural, right? In the metaphysical world of philosophy and theology. So these are two specific challenges to what I just said, that if in so many is immediate and in so many is individual and indivisible, how do we get uh, two souls when a zygote or a blastocyst or a, an early embryo splits into two, which is called monozygotic twinning, all right? What happens that so that so cannot be split into two. So there's a challenge. Let's look at that. And the other one that I keep mentioning is twin reabsorption. One at a time. First of all, to do a little review of uh, twinning, there are three types of twinning. Mm, actually two types, uh, conjoined is, uh, can be seen as a subset of monozygotic, we'll get there. So dizygotic, monozygotic already tell us, this is the other value. Uh, mono is single or one, one zygote. Dizygotic, di is two, all right? So this one comes from two uh, zygotes. And uh, I think I have a little diagram here. Yep, here we go. So when we have dizygotic twins, also known as fraternal twins, hmm? 
what do we have? To begin with, we have two eggs, two ova. So in other words, that means that in that cycle, that woman uh, ovulated two eggs. Could have been from the same side or a different size, but the fact is that there are two eggs available. And because there are millions of sperm around, on average, any mature egg that is hanging out at the ampulla is gonna get fertilized, <laughs> right? It's not a polar body, it's a full egg. Yeah, so some women ovulate sometimes two or more follicles. Mm -hmm. That's how you get twins or triplets or quadruplets that are fraternal because there are two or more eggs were actually ovulated uh, at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's rare, but it does happen. And so on average, they're gonna be fertilized and if they're viable, they will continue through embryonic development and do all they have to do and nine months later, they will be born. They can, uh, and that's why they can be either uh, girl, girl, boy, boy, or boy, girl. They can be the different sex because you know it's the sperm that determines, right? The the Y sperm or the X sperm, the 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 chromosome. And so, because it is a sperm that determines the sex, then it can either be the same, both the same sex, or a different sex, or one and one. Different from monozygotic, because monozygotic is telling us there's only one zygote, and therefore, before that, there's only one egg. Mm -hmm. These are also called identical twins, and with only one egg, is that large enough? It's a little small. Uh, don't want to lose the slide. Okay, so what happens? One egg is fertilized by one sperm, and then mitosis, geometric progression, up to two weeks after fertilization, it's known experimentally that the human embryo can split into two or more, all right? So it can happen at the morula stage, it can happen at the blastocyst stage, or even at the gastrula stage. And how do we know that? By the different placentas. If they had two placentas, then the split was very early. At the, at the moral stage, so you have two blastocysts and therefore two trophoblasts and therefore two placentas. You follow the biology, very straightforward. But if they're sharing one uh, amnion, one chorion, which is the outer membrane, but two amnions, two amniotic sacs, then the split happened uh, uh, after the blastocyst, mm -hmm. but before gastrulation. <laughs> and if they share amnion and chorion, in a single placenta, all right, then the split happened after gastrulation. <laughs> That's why it's up to two weeks. So you know it's one week to implantation and then another week through gastrulation till you get the three germ layers, maybe the three germ layers, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. All of the organ systems come from those three layers, right? Okay. So after gastrulation, then that's it. So that's the window of opportunity of up to two weeks in the human verified experimentally. And uh, each one of these is a full human being. You know, when they're born, they grow, they mature, they are fertile, they can um, reproduce, okay? And they're functional and so forth, so they're human beings. Um, typically, they are born with low birth weight simply because they're sharing the same uterus. <laughs> uh, and um, they are born uh, sometimes preemies or low birth weight, but they're always the same sex because they come from the one sperm. So they're always either both boys or girls and they're identical. Then the conjoined, I say is a subset of the um, identical because the conjoined are, as the word says, they are tied up at some point of their body. They're sharing some common organs. And then it depends how many vital organs they're sharing, whether they can be split or not later by surgery, okay? It's amazing, but you have many different cases. I'll show you some uh, cases. Um, uh, this was uh, the most simple case where they were just basically conjoined at uh, the belly, um, at the mid section, but they had separate vital organs. Uh, they had, each one had their own heart, their own lungs, their own liver, their own intestines and everything so that after the split, you see them here walking together. I think they're from Guatemala, these, these two girls. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were able to be split surgically. And now, of course, 
underneath, they're going to have big scars and all that, but they're two separate individuals. Hmm? And so they were fortunate enough to share, to not share vital organs and therefore be able to be split. This is an even simpler case where they're just sharing part of the skull, but that can be split also. And even if they're sharing the same skull plate, uh, the plates can be replaced with metal or maybe some synthetic uh, material, but they have two brains and everything from the brain down, one can see that uh, is individual, all right? Very different for the Hensel sisters who share vital organs from the neck down, <laughs> okay? And they have two heads. So would you say that this is one person or two persons? Any natural intuition would say they have two faces, two countenances, two persons, two personalities. In fact, they're showing different personalities just by their expression. They even comb differently. <laughs> but they only have two hands, two legs, one heart, one liver. Hmm? Which also tells me that the seat of consciousness is definitely in the brain. <laughs> is from the neck up, right? And uh, that's one way of looking at the body from the neck down, it's a support system of the brain. It's a support system. Hmm? But uh, you know that uh, science continues to advance and, and progress and at some point there will be perhaps a fully artificial body from the neck down. <laughs> for some people who are quadriplegic, for example, I have a friend of mine, he fell from a, doing presses on a bench as an exercise. He, severed his neck and became quadriplegic from the waist down, can't move, lives in a bed or takes about two hours to hoist him out of the bed to put him in a wheelchair. But he thinks perfectly, he paints with one of those long uh, paintbrushes uh, with his mouth and so forth. But uh, you know, he's immobile. So very challenging, but very real and anyone I think who's uh, normal would say these are two persons, okay? Mm. Impossible to separate them. In fact, here's a bigger diagram. I don't want to dwell on it. You can study if you, if you want, especially if you're going to become an OBGYN or embryologist or a surgeon. They have identified in the, um, the uh, what is this called? The plate, mm, the embryonic disc, right? The embryonic disc from head to toe at gastrulation, right? How, where the joining occurs at the embryonic disc, what kind of conjoint twin will develop from there? It's amazing. But they have diagrammed this out into uh, two main regions, the DD fusion and the VV, dorsal-dorsal fusion, ventral-ventral fusion. And here are some examples of the subsets. It is amazing how it's been all worked out in the embryology, all right? And obviously some are uh, able to be split, others are not. Some cases are very, very challenging. How do we get two souls from one in the conjoined, I'm sorry, in the, um, in the case of monozygotic twins? Okay, I'm saying that philosophically and theologically, once we have a human zygote, God would grant a soul to that zygote so that there will be a compatibility between the conscience and the uh, organic development. So that's no problem over here for dizygotic twins because we have individual developments from the zygote forward. How about here? Well, here is one plausible scenario that doesn't deny the biology of what's going on and makes sense uh, philosophically. Up until at the zygote stage, we have a single individual, one soul, all right? At the moral stage, let's say the two cell stage, we have still a single individual here and one soul. When the split happens, whether the split happens at the moral stage or the blastocyst stage or the gastro stage, but whenever that split happens, one of the twins remains with the original soul and the other twin, at that moment of the twinning, the other twin gets a soul from God. In other words, God, if God is God, he's not restricted to donate a soul, to grant a soul only at the zygotic stage, but rather when we have a new individual. So up until this point, let's say with the first scenario of split at the morula, we have an individual. During the moral stage, when those blastomeres separate radically, all right, and become two individuals, one individual 
retains the original soul, the other individual receives the soul from God. There's a philosophical consistency with that argument. The only thing is we will never know which of the two individuals had the original soul and which got the soul at the twinning, <laughs> okay? But one of the two got it, the other one carried it through. We would never know which because it's in the priority of, of only God knows, literally. That same argument can be made either for the morla, the blastocyst, or the gastrula. In other words, when we go from one to two individuals, then that other individual, whoever that is, gets the new soul and moves forward. Mm, I find it uh, an argument of logical consistency, philosophically, because God is not constricted or restrained to granting a soul only at the zygotic stage. Okay, we can pause here for a moment. You can think about it a little bit, digest it. Uh, if you find a flaw in that argument, please bring it forward. <laughs> but, uh, I've examined it over time, and uh, I think it's, it's a logical consistency that doesn't do any violence to the biology. Forward? Okay, let's talk about twin reabsorption. <laughs> this one is more challenging, in my mind, because what happens here is kind of the reverse. We go from two individuals, one, okay? So I'm saying that the soul is personal, indivisible, and non-reabsorbable, <laughs> right? Because it's personal, and for all eternity, we have this one soul for all eternity. Uh, so mm, it's not the case of uh, a type of embryonic mm, reincarnation <laughs> that is occurring here, okay? Twin reabsorption or banishing twins. Here's some biological evidence. Here is obviously uh, on sonogram a, uh, an, an embryo, a human embryo. And here is a vanishing twin here. The embryologists tell us that. The, the radiologists are capable of interpreting this. They're telling us, so we have to take the clinical word for it, okay? It's a vanishing twin. It happens. And sometimes uh, they're also called parasitic twins. Here are some actual examples. Uh, this uh, person, looks like a female to me, but I can't really tell, has something growing on her back, right? That looks like some embryonic development, but it's certainly not, uh, I don't know if I would call this human or not, frankly, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know. It had some kind of development, right? And I think that this is the tail end and this is the head end. This would be the trunk. Maybe this is the, the, the buds of the legs that they were developed. I don't know what this means. Uh, this looks like maybe an eye, okay? But it's parasitic. It's embedded. Uh, I don't know if it can be operated or not. Uh, I would hope it is, but uh, this would be parasitic. More challenging is head that is here is that some semblance of a face of a countenance and some looks like it's smiling but I think it's just the way that the mouth is developing there those seem to be teeth there but there's nothing underneath so this is certainly non-viable mm -hmm. and it's parasitizing on this other fellow who looks from the head down looks pretty normal and so definitely this needs to be cut off <laughs> okay whatever it is or was Mm -hmm. I think that anyone uh, would say this needs to be cut off and maybe buried, given a, a burial, but it's not viable. It would be alive. Yes, it would be alive. I don't know. I don't know. It would be some kind of interesting research to do it. How, how much of the face? Yes, so I think what's happening here is that internally, all of these tissues that are alive, right? Even if they are abnormal and awkward, they're parasitizing, they're sucking from this other twin who is normal. And while they were in the womb, of course, they were connected, uh, at least there was one placenta here and one umbilical cord, so it was less drastic in the womb, 
the, the parasitism was less drastic, but now that this baby has to feed on himself, by himself and so forth, you know, if this continues to parasitize, I'm especially concerned for the brain, that this brain may not develop normally, okay? Uh, and so definitely uh, has to be cut off. So how about proposing in the reabsorption, in the case of reabsorption, this is one possible scenario. In fact, I have it written out here. Okay, so the monozygotic twins we saw for reabsorption. We start with one soul. Then there's a split, we have two souls. But the two souls then either it's conjoined and gets reabsorbed, or even if they're separate and the other twin gets reabsorbed, right? When the reabsorption happens, one of the twins dies dies and so there is death and that soul goes to the mystery and the mercy of God and the other soul continues all right so this baby to me I feel no problem in having a soul but this one since it's not viable maybe God did not grant a soul to begin with we'll never know but it's definitely not viable I don't think that this has a soul mm -hmm. But my point is that we can make the case, at least philosophically, that when the reabsorption occurs or the resorption occurs, the reabsorbed twin dies. And so that soul, if it ever had a soul, will go to God. And the other twin continues living with his or her soul or consciousness, you know, a normal life. As, and I think this scenario is valid philosophically as long as there's no minimal time required for a human to be human. <laughs> so as long as we keep that in mind that there's no minimal time, you know, from the zygote forward, maybe it was at the moral stage, maybe at the blastocyst stage, or maybe at the gastro stage that the other twin got reabsorbed. Well, that was their lifespan. It could have been a few days, a few weeks, a few months but then they died and they were reabsorbed. And so that can figure it out. But I think that we can present a logical philosophical argument, a reasonable argument for maintaining the individuality of the soul if we follow this sequence here for reabsorption. When that twin dies, then that soul goes to where it's supposed to go. <laughs> and the other twin continues with their soul or their consciousness. All right. Uh, this videos, um, I'll leave them for you to see so that I don't lose uh, more time here because I see we're after three o'clock already. So you can watch these videos. And uh, there's another one on the first presentation that is a uh, very fast, chronology of embryonic development from fertilization to birth in about six minutes. <laughs> okay, and it's very well done. The only thing is on the first video, which is on the first PowerPoint presentation, my suggestion is, well, I don't know, maybe you like acid rock, but I don't like acid rock. Uh, there's no description going on, um, but the, the, fur, the guy who did it, the fellow who did it, uh, who seems to be the husband of a uh, mom who is pregnant, uh, just put acid rock as background, which normally what I do is I cut off the, the sound, the noise, and I narrate what's going on in the video. It's, it's very interesting, just in six minutes uh, compressed. Okay, let's move forward now because uh, we have to cover the first controversial, super controversial topic to our day, which is abortion, squarely into uh, the bioethics of it. And I hope that you can see where I'm going from the arguments that I've been presenting on the principle of bioethics. We would say that yes, the unborn is human, as human as the born in a, in a early stage of development, okay? But human. And uh, so that's going to present a tremendous challenge when abortion is legal in the country for almost 50 years now, about 48 years, it's 1973. Just to uh, review then, for normal fertilization, happens in the ampulla, and about five to seven days later, 
there is implantation in a different region of the female reproductive tract, which is the endometrium, and there is development going on through that whole stage. All right. Okay. Now, with regard to abortion, again, the the way we do bioethics is a two-step thing. First, we look at the bio, and then we look at the ethics of it. So our ethical analysis is based on what is happening in nature. And therefore, we have to look a little bit at uh, abortion, the, the terminology first, then the methods, and finally, alternatives to abortion. If we're saying that abortion should not be done, then we have to offer alternatives, right? OK, so with regards to abortion, we have to make a critical distinction between spontaneous or procured abortion. Because a spontaneous abortion or a miscarriage, there is really no ethical guilt involved there. It's an act of nature. And typically, it's because of some chromosomal abnormality that I mentioned. That's the 50% average, more or less, depending on who you read. Uh, some people put it as high as 80% uh, pregnancy loss, natural pregnancy loss in the human. It's hard to measure early on, you know, because in the first two weeks, uh, the woman may be thinking that she's just late in her period, and, but she's actually having an early loss of uh, she's losing an early embryo that may, may not be implanting. Okay, so it's hard to measure. Uh, but at any rate, when, when these um, embryos or fetuses have been uh, recovered and analyzed in the lab, especially a karyotype or something like that, then uh, we notice that there is typically chromosomal abnormalities. And so again, it's a natural process of selection what's going on, right? That's a spontaneous abortion. When it's early on, before the eight weeks after, it's called miscarriage. It's just a technical difference, like embryo and fetus, but it, essentially it's a natural process where there is no guilt involved. You know, unless the woman was totally irresponsible about her pregnancy, she's eight months pregnant and she goes horseback riding for three hours, you know, galloping through the woods, <laughs> that pouncing may trigger a, uh, a miscarriage, right? Okay. Procured abortion is different and it's known by various uh, words, procured or elective or induced, but this is the human will is engaged here and the woman is actually going to the abortion clinic to get an abortion, all right, for any number of reasons. Uh, but the fact is that the will is here engaged, desiring the termination of that pregnancy, which by the way, again, the euphemisms, we have to be very alert in, in bioethics, you have to be very, very critical of the language that is being used. All right, because the language will be used to, to play around with the brain, with the mind. And you think about it, termination of pregnancy, the, that phrase termination, what's a natural, normal termination of pregnancy? Birth, nine months later, right? That's the end of pregnancy, termination of pregnancy. But now it's used, termination of pregnancy, it's a euphemism for not saying abortion <laughs> because of the impact that the word has to this day. All right, let's move forward. Uh, Let's look at some of the uh, methods here. Uh, first thing I wanna point out is that these three methods of, abort, of um, contraception are also abortifacients. I don't wanna dwell on this too much because I'll pick it up next week when I talk about uh, contraceptives, okay? I'm gonna talk about this in the context of uh, contraception, uh, how these uh, methods can also be abortifacient and I'll give you the evidence uh, uh, next week when we talk about it. So let me move forward for a moment and get a little bit more into the terminology because uh, this one is from Keith Moore, which is a standard uh, classical um, book on uh, human embryology for mm -hmm. medical schools, all right? Uh, this is just directly from his textbook. The, these different types of abortion, how they are uh, defined, for example, threatened abortion is that the abortion is not occurring, but may happen, a spontaneous abortion because there's bleeding. Um, a spontaneous abortion I talked about. Habitual is when there's two or more abortions uh, that a woman has, cannot hold a pregnancy, okay? Has the habit of uh, aborting spontaneously and it's challenging because she keeps losing the pregnancies. Induced abortion is what we're talking about here, where the will is engaged to actually procure the abortion willingly, all right, uh, to dislodge and uh, discard that uh, embryo or fetus. Complete is when all of the products of the abortion have been taken out of the woman. 
This is extremely important clinically because if any parts of that abortion stay within the woman's uterus, that can cause a massive infection and therefore uh, it can bring the death of the mother, okay? Uh, missed abortion is a, a conceptus that should have been aborted but stayed within the womb. And sometimes we get uh, something that is called a papyriform fetus, uh, a baby, uh, an embryo or a fetus who died in the womb. And then there was a subsequent pregnancy and that fetus was never dislodged from the womb. And, but with the subsequent pregnancy, that fetus is pressed against the uterine wall and becomes thin, all right? And it's called papyriform because it looks like paper, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's a whole little embryo there, fetus papyriform. It's a very rare case, uh, but that would be a case of a missed abortion where the embryo of the fetus died naturally, but was never discarded. Maybe the woman didn't even, even uh, realize she was pregnant. Sometimes you hear in the news, you know, sometimes she's five or six months pregnant and she doesn't know she's pregnant. <laughs> you hear some cases like that sometimes, okay? Uh, anyway, <clears throat> that's the missed abortion thing. And the miscarriage is later uh, in um, like the second or third trimester um, of a spontaneous abortion miscarriage. Those are the different terminologies there. The one that we're concerned, of course, is the procured or um, elective abortion, right? Because the will is definitely engaged. Okay, some stats here. Uh, since it was legalized in 1973, about 60 million abortions have been done in the United States legally. And by the way, in the United States, abortion is legal up until the ninth month, all right? Which is another misconception that is out there. Of course, after the second trimester, after the first trimester, the woman the mom needs to have uh, some kind of a clinical reason. However, because it is legal, a woman may always find an OBGYN that will certify that this uh, pregnancy is causing distress because that is enough for the woman to claim that uh, to, to uh, seek an abortion after uh, the first trimester. She can just say that this is distressing to me. I don't want this pregnancy and that is sufficient legally, all right? so. Sadly, there is the, oh no, the, the, the second trimester or third trimester uh, human embryo is protected. Yeah, but there's a huge loophole whereby uh, a truck can fit through there. Simply, she just needs to claim that uh, she doesn't want that is causing her distress and because mental distress is also considered uh, ill health, right? It's mental health or mental ill health, then it qualifies, okay? Now, these are some different techniques according to trimester, first, second, third trimester. Uh, obviously in the first trimester, it is much easier because the fetus, I'm sorry, the embryo is still very uh, young and tender and the whole embryo can be sucked out with a vacuum mm -hmm. or it can be uh, scraped off with a curette. So B and C, you see this is a very common one uh, dilation and curettage. Dilation means that the cervix needs to be dilated to get those instruments in there. And then a curettage is a, cur a curette is a particular type of scalpel that is very uh, sharp and uh, curved. These are some curettes. All right, you can see that they are just uh, sharp and steel so that it can be uh, sterilized. They come in different sizes, depending on uh, the stage of development and so forth. But basically the embryo is scraped off the uterus literally and then uh, sucked out with a vacuum. That's uh, the DNC. I'm just covering the biology now, then we'll do the ethical analysis, obviously. Uh, when it moves forward, at some point, the, the bones are beginning to ossify, to calcify, and therefore it's not as easy to cut the, the embryo in pieces or the fetus and has to be taken out more intact. So that typically is called the dilation and evacuation, DNE, or even further in the, into the third trimester, a DNX, which is a, a, an extraction, an intact extraction. And the most drastic of those is just before birth, actually. So legally, legally, the legal person, until the head of 
the fetus is not literally outside of the woman's body, that fetus doesn't have any legal protection, okay? It's not recognized as a legal person until the head is literally out of the body. And therefore, a minute before birth, a human embryo can still be killed, a human fetus can still be killed, as long as the head is not out. So the most drastic procedure, which is called DNX or partial birth abortion, mm, what they do is they flip the embryo, they flip the embryo to a breech position. This is called breech position. You know, the normal birthing is the head first, right? So this is called breech position. You can look it up later, basically. But they flip the embryo, the fetus inside, and then they pull out the fetus partially, but leave the head inside. Then the, the surgeon will go in and nip the neck, cut the spinal cord, literally. So it's like a mini micro, mini beheading, okay? Mini decapitation, partial decapitation. Cut the spinal cord. At that moment, the fetus dies. And then they suck out the brain to produce a craniotomy. In other words, that the skull now can be uh, collapsed and now it's much easier to pull out the head, all right? But they have to make sure that uh, the fetus is dead before coming out, otherwise it would be murder, all right? And this is partial birth abortion. This is so gruesome that Congress actually banned it, but the Supreme Court uh, um, knocked it down because it impinges on the legal right of a woman to have an abortion up until the nine months. And you can always find a doctor that has some clinical justification for this, <laughs> even though uh, there really isn't a clinical justification for this to save the life of the mother or the health of the mother at this stage, just before birth, really. You know, if the fetus had been a danger to the mother, let's say high blood pressure or eclampsia or any of those issues, that issue would have either killed the mother already at this stage, or the issue would have been resolved, okay, uh, clinically. But anyway, that's uh, the most drastic one, partial birth, and it's still legal in the United States to this day. So, we go back to a little bit of history here. Mm, first, any questions on the biology and the technology of doing an abortion? And I apologize for this, but I, I think it's important to cover it so that you see the various techniques are according to the trimester. And that's why, that's also why, see the technique varies by trimester, right? Because there's development going on. That's why every abortion clinic has to do a sonogram on the pregnant mom, but they will not show the sonogram to the mother. <laughs> why? because the mother is gonna start bonding with, if the mother has not bonded with that baby yet, when she sees that sonogram and she sees the heartbeat, which by the way is faster, boom, 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 it's about 150 beats per minute, what's normal heartbeats? The pulse, 60, 70, 80, right? But the human embryo, the human fetus has 150 to 200 heartbeat because there's so much going on developmentally. I mean, in nine months, the, the growth that happens is amazing. One time I did that, that um, estimate, let's just go back here for a moment. Uh, one time I estimated, what is the growth, just in size, it growth. In the diameter, first of all, let's look at the growth from birth forward. Let's say that a baby for the sim simplicity of, of arithmetic, okay, let's say that a baby is born a foot long, right? And we grow as, where we reach our maximum height as adults, let's say, all right, to what? Six feet is a tall person, right? Six feet, so from five to six feet. So from birth to the rest of our lives, we grow about six times, five to six times more, right? Five to six times more in the 80 or how many years we live. In fact, after a certain time, we start shrinking, actually, I've begun to shrink already. <laughs> because we lose calcium on the vertebrae and the column starts collapsing. <laughs> At any rate, let's say that we grow maximum 
six times more from birth to uh, the end of our lives. How about during the first nine months? How much do we grow just physically, all right? The human zygote, which is uh, about the size of, a, of an egg, of a human egg, of an ovum, which is about 10 microns <laughs> across, all right? And by the time that baby is born, uh, 12 inches, uh, one foot, it's about 5,000 times <laughs> the growth rate, <laughs> about 5,000 times from the original growth rate in less than one year. So we do most of our growth in less than one year. Inside our mother's womb, we do most of our growth. And that's an, that also points out the, the elegance of uh, pregnancy for mammals, because it's when most of the growth occurs on the individual or whatever species of mammal, and it's protected. <laughs> is protected literally within the mother. So it's not even exposed like an egg, for example, that can get crushed, <laughs> oh, let alone a, a fish egg that is just floating at the bottom of the, uh, in the water, okay? So maximum protection with gestation for mammals. The most sophisticated, and that's why also we have to, we, need, we only need to produce a few offspring as opposed to hundreds of thousands of the fish or other uh, or smaller uh, animals or lower, let's say more primitive animals or less developed because it's a numbers issue. <laughs> it's a numbers issue of selection, right? Uh, they have less protection. Okay, let me move forward uh, all the way down here to the ethical analysis. Right, we go back to 1973. Before 1973, abortion was legal in some states and not legal in other states. It was legal in New York, for example, and it was not legal in Texas. That is significant because it is in Texas that the, uh, that the, the case began for legalizing abortion, okay? In fact, just uh, last month, there was a movie that came out. Uh, I highly recommend it. It's just called like that, Roe versus Wade. Take a look at it. It's a full length movie that, that is done, um, reenacting everything that happened around uh, Roe. These names are uh, fictitious names to protect the innocent or to maintain the confidentiality, the privacy, which by the way was precisely the right to privacy was the big issue here. Okay, but Roe, Wade was the name, it's actually the last name of the uh, counselor who was handled in the case in Texas, which was the state of Texas, because in Texas abortion was illegal and therefore uh, the state had a vested interest in maintaining the pregnancy of Jane Roe. She was called Jane Roe, uh, fictitiously. Later on, by her own admission, we know that she was Norma McCorvey, okay? Norma McCorvey. And Wade represented the state of Texas. So the state of Texas was trying to, uh, was uh, advocating on behalf of Norma's uh, embryo, <laughs> her fetus. Mm -hmm. And Norma wanted an abortion. She was manipulated by some radical feminists at the time and pushed forward, and a, a fellow who was behind it all manipulating the thing because he wanted to legalize abortion in the United States and said, this is the case that is gonna go all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court at that time happened to be more on the pro-abortion side than on the pro-life side, the nine judges. In fact, there was a change of judges that was happening and there was a naming of an extra judge at that time, et cetera. Uh, so anyway, uh, Roe versus Wade, at some point, Norma McCorvey, right? First of all, she ended up not having the abortion. She won the case, all right, to the right for an abortion, became legal in February of 1973. Uh, she ended up not having the abortion. <laughs> she ended up having her baby, uh, but she was pro-abortion, and she became a staunch pro-abortionist that would go from town to town and city to city promoting abortions and even helping women having abortions in the abortion clinics. And one day, she was in an abortion clinic years after uh, Roe v. Wade, all right? And she was just there um, counseling some women and helping some women because it's a very distressful thing. Some women, many actually are crying and are uh, doubtful. That's why they don't show her the sonogram. Mm -hmm. uh, she was looking at a poster of embryology, of embryonic development, very similar to the things that I've been showing you here. You know, something similar to this. She so was just looking at the poster, which was actually in the abortion clinic there uh, being displayed. She was looking at it. And I'm gonna give you her own testimony, which you can look it up online. 
This is her testimony when she was looking at that poster. I was sitting in an OR and um, operation room in an abortion clinic when I noticed a fetal development poster. The progression was so obvious. The eyes were so sweet. It hurt my heart just looking at them. I ran outside and finally it dawned on me. Norma, I said to myself, they're right. I had worked with pregnant women for years. I had been through three pregnancies and deliveries myself. I should have known. Yet something in that poster made me lose my breath. I kept seeing the picture of that tiny 10 week old embryo. And I said to myself, that's a baby. It's as if blinders just came off my eyes and I suddenly understood the truth, that's a baby. I felt crushed under the truth of this realization. I had to face up to the awful reality. Abortion wasn't about products of conception, the euphemisms. It wasn't about missed periods. It wasn't about children. It was about children being killed in their mother's wombs. All those years, I was wrong. Signing that affidavit, I was wrong. The affidavit, the court affidavit, where she was uh, facing the claim, all right? that she wanted an abortion. Working at an abortion clinic, I was wrong. No more of this first trimester, second trimester, third trimester stuff. Abortion at any point was wrong. It was so clear, painfully clear. This was Jane Rowe in her own words. It is amazing. And so what does she do for the rest of her life? She died recently. She spent the rest of her life becoming pro-life and going even to abortion clinics trying to convince women not to have abortions, okay? Because of the realization she finally came to the truth. And uh, it was very courageous, I think, for her to uh, make these statements and to go public on it and to realize the huge mistake. But at that point, it was years. I don't know exactly when her conversion was, but uh, maybe 20 years ago or so, was way into the legalization of abortion already. And so if we're going to uh, uphold principled bioethics, all right, we have to understand and admit and realize that we have a human being from conception, from fertilization forward. And further, that that human being in his or her mother's womb is the most dependent human of us all because they cannot defend themselves on their own. They depend on advocacy, okay? They depend on advocacy. Just like it's happening now for the elderly who are either demented or senile and they depend on advocacy too because they cannot defend it. But at least those we can see and it's still illegal. Well, it's becoming more and more legal with uh, uh, physician-assisted suicide. We'll get, we'll get there in a couple of weeks. It only gets tougher. Uh, another one who converted was Bernard Nathanson. Bernard Nathanson was um, an abortion uh, provider. He had hundreds of clinics throughout the United States, abortion clinics. He said himself at one point, um, he said, when I did my abortion number 3000, I stopped counting him personally. And he had literally hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, abortion doctors throughout the whole United States. He is the largest abortion provider in the United States. He converted also to pro-life. And then he spent the rest of his life going to pro-life rallies. I remember hearing him one time, it was, must have been in the 80s, uh, that I went to a, a pro-life talk that he gave. Uh, he has died since also. Um, I also want to say, I need to say for full disclosure that both of these people after their conversion, after their conversion to pro-life, eventually they also converted to Catholicism. <laughs> Nathanson was Jewish. Uh, McCormey was, had no denomination, all right? And they both eventually converted to Catholicism. So I can imagine their confessions <laughs> must have been very, very heavy duty, all right? But if there is repentance, God forgives. And this kind of repentance, God forgives. Okay, and these people walk out of that confessional squeaky clean, as we say, <laughs> in their soul. So it's amazing. It's, it's very comforting. 
At any rate, I want to present uh, alternatives, of course. What are the two obvious alternatives? Either she keeps the baby or she gives the baby up for adoption. The challenge with adoption, of course, is that after a few months of the pregnancy, she's bonding with that baby and she doesn't want to give him up anymore. That's the big challenge, right? And so, but what, what kind of logic is it that I would rather kill the baby than give him up? <laughs> okay, so that's why I say that women who give up their children for adoption, their babies for adoption, they're unborn, are extremely courageous. And they're not thinking about themselves, they're thinking about their baby. All right, they're gonna continue living. So why not let that other kid live? It's hard to adopt in the United States. Just a normal straight up adoption of a baby is very difficult, very hard because you don't find babies. Most babies, people keep them, right? The ones they don't want, they abort. And so there are literally thousands and thousands of couples who cannot have children of their own and they want to adopt and they can't find. So they have to go to Latin America, they have to go to Russia or Asia to adopt babies because they can't find babies here. And so really I'm, I'm saying that if you ever know of uh, a woman who is pregnant and is distressed and she really can't have the baby or doesn't just want the baby, just send her over to one of these resources and uh, we will happily uh, take care of it, you know, and, and get her uh, either someone to adopt that child or give her the support that she needs. This covers the whole gamut from the actual clinical, she gets, uh, any woman who's pregnant right now can get free uh, care, pregnancy care from the state. And even if she has other children, the other children, and she gets the pregnancy care, of course, and she gets the medical care and her other born children also get the care for free from the state. One of my cousins works in uh, the Department of Children and Families, DCF, and I'm constantly calling her, asking her for help for pregnant moms that, are, that I come to hear about, you know, and sure enough, they get her all, the, all that she needs, um, uh, food, housing, etc. And then also on the spiritual or psychological realm, we have uh, counselors that can help any pregnant mom uh, with her pregnancy, the whole idea is to have her uh, give life to her child and not death, okay? So that's uh, the bottom line here. I include my cell phone number here and I forgot to do it. I promise I'll have it for you uh, next time, but you have the slide anyway. Usually what I do is I print this out and I give it out to the students. Uh, so you can also give it out. If you want extra copies, uh, I'll give you extra copies too. So that these are resources. Because one thing is to say, don't have an abortion, but then uh, we have to give alternatives, right? We have to give viable alternatives so that the woman can follow through. And there's a whole network of um, individuals and organizations that are willing to help the mom. No judgment, just let's save, let's rally to save this child so that the child can have life, just like our parents gave us life. Okay, I've got a lot again in a little time. So you probably have to digest some of this, but you have the slides. Do look at those. Uh, at this point, there will be three, one a little video from the first presentation and then two other videos are embedded in this one that you can look at, okay? And for the rest, we'll meet next Monday. All right, and go forward. So next week, hopefully we'll cover contraception and in vitro fertilization and natural family planning. But if there's anything from here that you want to bring over and ask, please feel free to do that. All right. Okay. Eliza, you're okay? Yes, I'm good. Okay. So I'm going to stop the recording now. Okay. Thanks again. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I mentioned. Uh, not PDF, but uh, Word document for the summaries, right? And email me like you have been doing. All right. Mm -hmm. Thanks again. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.